It's time to stop letting life happen to us. Our God is too big, and our Savior has sacrificed too much for us to just float through life. Things will happen to us this week, this month, this year. We need to be ready for what is coming, for whatever comes our way. Let us be ready for the battles that we may face and to be ready for the battles that we will face. Let us use peace, community, and love as weapons and partner with Jesus to be battle ready. Right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the heart. You guys, I'm so glad that you made it today. Um, I know on days like this, I'd rather stay in bed. So good for you. Look at you. You made it. Uh, my name is Dominic. I'm the leader here uh, at the heart. And um, uh, before we get cooking in anything, I want to tell you about something. Uh, you should have one of these in your hands. If you don't, that means you're still sitting on it. So why don't you uh, work your abs and kind of stretch up a little bit, uh, grab this from underneath. And, uh, and, and I want to tell you about this real quick about our HC mixer. This is, um, we have a couple of things that are, uh, that we do here at the heart throughout the, throughout the weeks, throughout the months that are meant to um, foster and build connection and community. What makes this uh, this group of people, this community, this church so powerful is not my speaking ability. What makes this church so powerful is not uh, the band, even though the band is amazing. What makes this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure they appreciate all four of those. Um, the, what makes this, uh, <laughs> what makes this community so powerful is that we are willing to get into each other's messes and walk through those messes together. We're able, to, uh, we're able to, to put aside our pride and kind of step into the mess of life together. And that's where the real growth in this community happens. So HC Mixer is a great opportunity to be able to maybe invite someone that you've been uh, thinking about. Or, you know, you, if you're enjoying, you know, coming to church or going to Connect Group uh, and, and you want to invite somebody to it. Well, HC Mixer is great because it, it's, it's a place to be able to build connection. And we're not going to trick anybody. Right? We're not going like, to you know, baptize them as they walk in or like, you know, hand them a snake. or You know what I mean? Uh, Christians, if you don't know, are also just normal people. And so we want to be able to just hang out with people with no agenda, um, nothing sneaky. We just want to be able to get to know people. And it's great for you if, you if you're new to the heart over the last couple of weeks or a couple of months. Or maybe you, uh, you always come to the 11 o'clock and you don't know anybody at the 930. HC Mixer is great because we're able to meet each other and, and, and be a part of each other's Live. So uh, I want to invite you to that. If you've already been, I want to challenge you to bring someone with you, um, and, and you can take one of these with you. That you can get more information on the Church Center uh, app and, and, and do all of that. If you have any questions on any of this, you can always go see us at the Connect Center. So that's uh, that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. Now, um, if it's your first time today at the Heart, you picked a great Sunday to be here. We're we're wrapping up our message series that we're in called Battle Ready. We've been doing this for about for about six weeks, this particular message series. So uh, if it's your first time or you, maybe you don't remember, I want to give you the, the quickest, most concise of recaps. Uh, we, we, when we look at our, our year, what's ahead of us, or we look at our life, what's ahead of us, we can have this, this perspective, this like, I, I hope nothing bad happens. You know, 2018 was the worst, or 2017 was the worst, or, you know, my whole life has been the worst. You know what I mean? You want to look ahead and say, okay, I hope 2019 isn't also going to be terrible. I hope 2019 is not going to be the worst. And what we want to do is change our perspective to I hope bad things don't happen to putting our hope in God. And when our hope is in God, whatever is coming our way, we're going to be battle ready. Because as we've been saying, if you're ready for the battle, then you're going to be steady in the battle. We're going to be battle ready, battle steady. So whatever comes our way, because there's going to be problems. There's going to be trials and tribulations. There's going to be issues that pop up in your marriage. There's going to be issues that come up with your parenting. There's going to be problems in school, problems at your job. And it's not about speaking negatively or thinking negatively about these things, but it's saying if we know that they're coming, instead of letting those things turn our world upside down, we're going to be ready so when the battle hits, when the storm comes, we, we can be expecting. We can say, yeah, I knew something like this was going to happen, and I'm ready for it. So we've been talking, we've been spending some weeks talking about how you can be prepared for it. And we said one of the things is you can be grateful, having gratitude, thanking God, praising God for what he is, for, for what he's done, 
for the things that he's doing in your life that can help change our perspective on the battle in front of us. And then we said that you have self-control, and that's difficult. That's difficult to have self-control because it means you are now responsible for the way you respond to the people in your life. You can't, you can't say, they're making me angry because you have self-control. You have the spiritual gift of self-control. And then we said that there is power in community. That's what we are just talking about. We have power in community. When you have people around you, then when you go face a battle, instead of going to face the battle on your own, when you have this community around you, it makes the battle seem different, look different. Then this past week, we said that you can carry peace along with you. Peace is something that you can use to be battle ready, but peace is one of those things that you can bring with you in the battle. You can have peace and you can choose peace. Now, what we've been saying through all of these is none of these will change the battle that you're going to face, right? If you, got, if you got a report from the doctor and, and something's wrong or you're having some issues in your marriage, you're not going to be able to say, uh, well, I, I, I'm grateful, and then your marriage problems go away. No, the battles are going to stay the same, but what these things do, they allow us to look at the battle differently. The battle doesn't seem as wild. It doesn't seem as big when we have all of these tools that have been given to us by God. And we, when we look at this battle, our perspective changes. In the battle, it's the same battle, but somehow it doesn't seem as daunting if we are battle ready. So today I want to dig a little bit further into that, and it's going to be the last one, and this, doesn't, this isn't the only five, you know, five ways to win your battle in 2019. That's not what it is. You can dig more and learn more and read more and study more. But today I want to talk about the power of forgiveness. And what I usually do is, and maybe you never noticed or, uh, or don't care, and that's okay, but each week I, I, I try to hang on one, one concept or one thing where you can, when you leave, you just have to remember one Thing, but today, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to use two. I'm gonna have to use two because I think there are two powerful, two two way street here in forgiveness. One is the forgiveness we need to give, the people in our life that we need to forgive. But something that is just as powerful is understanding and realizing and holding on to the forgiveness that we have from God. These are two things that will set us free, being able to forgive and being able to see that we are forgiven. Now, I want to look at a couple of scriptures uh, uh, here today, but I I want to tell you something. I, I I need my people here, okay, so get ready. I have a personality where if I feel like I have wronged you, I really need to be forgiven as quickly as possible. Is anybody... Anybody like that a little bit? Okay. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm analyzing your eye movements and, like, you know, how you answered the phone or the text back. Did it have the dot, 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 or did you put a period? Or You know what I mean? Anybody else? You know what I mean? Like, you're just overanalyzing and, oh, well, what does that mean? Ah, okay, you're still mad at me. Okay, 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 okay. I want to be forgiven. I, I, I want to I get that cleared up. I need to be whole. What can I do for you? Can I buy you something? And this was, this was tough for me this week because I, I think sometimes what, you know, what society has done or at least maybe America has done has set up, you know, people who work at a church or do church stuff or church people or Christians or people who do what I do that like, they've got it figured out or they're, they're good with God and their relationship with God is strong and their marriage is great and I'm sure they're good at forgiving people and they're always patient with their kids. And, <laughs> and some of those are sometimes true but I'm just trying to figure life out like everybody else. I'm struggling through life like everybody else. I'm facing battles just like everybody else is. Same things that happen to me happen to you. Same things that happen to you happen to me. So when I was getting ready for this message this week about forgiveness, man, there was some some things that came up, and I thought, well, I, I have forgiven that person. And then I started talking about them, and I was like, well, maybe I have not. That ever happened to you? You're like, yeah, I've forgiven them. I said I forgave them. I put it on Twitter, so now it's public record, and that's, you know, it's, it's real now. And then the name comes up, and you're like, oh, gross. Why'd you talk to them? You know? And that was coming up, and I'm like, man, I didn't realize I still had that unforgiveness that I was holding on to. Why am I still holding on to that? And you know what's interesting is about, we're, we're looking at a couple of scriptures today in the Bible. Did you know that in the Bible, 
There are over 50, 60, 70, depending on your translation. You can, you can look at any translation and look up scriptures about forgiveness, and you'll get, you know, Google will hit you back. I'm going to get you back. Here's a, bunch of, here's a bunch of forgiveness scriptures. Here's what God says. Here's what Jesus says. Here's what the Psalms say. Here's what different scriptures say. All about forgiveness, but there's not one that will explicitly tell you how to forgive, <laughs> right? It will tell you all the, all, all the great things that happen when you forgive. And there's plenty that tell you that you should forgive. But how come we don't have one? Couldn't God just have made it super easy and say, this is how you forgive? I think it's, I think it's complicated. We're complicated people. We are made by a God who wants us to be in community with one another, who wants us to grow with one another. So I, I want to be able to talk through a couple things about forgiveness today, but I, I want you to know that forgiveness, it's not either you have forgiven someone or you haven't. Forgiveness can be a journey, and I want you to let yourself be on a forgiveness journey with where you're at. Now, I'm sure as we talk today, you're, you're, you're thinking of people that, that have wronged you and that have hurt you, people that people that you don't necessarily want to forgive, but you, you know that you're holding on to something. I want you to be thinking about that. For some of you, this is going to be really tough to hear. It's going to be really tough to get through. But I want to be able to encourage you that there is freedom in forgiveness. There is freedom in the forgiveness that comes from God, and there is freedom in the forgiveness that comes from within us to others. So I want to look at a couple scriptures today. The first one is going to be Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians is a letter that was written by a man named Paul, and he wrote this letter to the, the, the church in Ephesus, probably a group of believers, a group of people who are trying to figure life out just like us. We don't know what we're doing. They didn't know what they were doing. And Paul's trying to help them out. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, he's telling them about their new life in Christ. You know, now that you know Jesus, here's some kind of things to do and some ways to go about life. So in 31, he says, lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults. That describe anybody's week right there. But instead, be kind and affectionate toward one another. Has God graciously forgiven you? Then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. Has God graciously forgiven you? That is a rhetorical question. The author is telling you that God has graciously forgiven you. So what I see here is that forgiveness has been modeled for us by God. Forgiveness has been modeled for us so we know what forgiveness looks like. So at least from this scripture here, we can say, maybe we can agree just for the moment, for the sake of argument, that forgiveness is possible. And we can see that it's possible that we're capable to forgive because God has graciously forgiven and I think for some of us, at least for me, I think forgiving is, is maybe, maybe enough, but graciously forgiving somebody, that's a tall order. You know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll forgive and like, all right, you know, and we'll hug it out, you know, and all right, good game, you know, get out there or whatever. <laughs> but graciously forgiving is different. There's heart behind that. There's soul behind that. There's love behind that. But we see it modeled. We see it modeled for us by God. So let's at least for the next 10, 15 minutes, let's assume, let's agree that forgiveness is possible, that we are able to forgive because God has forgiven us. So I want to dig a, a, a little bit more into Scripture. Mark, the book of Mark. Now, Mark is one of the four Gospels. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, Mark is one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there are four accounts of Jesus on earth, and it's when, you know, Jesus, uh, all the stories you hear about the miracles he performed and water to wine and, you know, walking on water and the story, uh, you know, the Easter story that you've heard of the cross, all of that is found within the Gospels. In this book of Mark, it's probably my favorite Gospel, but I, I want to read something in here. It's something, something that Jesus is teaching to his disciples. So there's sometimes that Jesus would teach, and he would teach through parables and stories and he would say something, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then create a metaphor. Or he would tell a parable about somebody losing a coin or somebody losing a sheep. There's some times, though, where Jesus would tell you exactly what he meant. And those words were recorded. So we're able to 
kind of get a glimpse of what Jesus was teaching. So I want to read a little bit of that right now. This is Mark 11, 25. It's talking about praying, praying boldly to God, coming boldly to God and bringing your prayers, bringing your problems, bringing your issues, bringing your worries. He says, and whenever you stand praying, if you find that you carry something in your heart against another person, release him and forgive him or her so that your Father in heaven will also release you and forgive you of your faults. Now, I want to look at a couple of things here because I think, I think sometimes we can read the Bible and we only read what it says. If, if, if you read through the Bible and you're only reading what it says, we are missing depths of history, of culture, of what could be seen. Because if we're, if we're reading this just for what it says, what we see is God won't forgive you if you don't forgive somebody else. God's going to punish you. Good luck getting into heaven, buster, if you're not going to forgive the people around you. But I think there could be something deeper. There is heart behind these words. Because it looks like something that stands in the way of you and your connection with the Father, something that stands in the way of you and your connection with heaven is unforgiveness. That stands in the way of your connection with God. And actually, unforgiveness stands in the way of connection, period. What what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to come to God with our problems. We're supposed to come to God with our issues. But what we're hearing from Jesus here is if you do come to God, make sure that you're not holding on to anything against anybody else. Because you can't be fully connected. Something is blocking it. You can't give all of yourself to God if a little bit of yourself is holding on to this resentment, this unforgiveness with whoever hurt you, with whoever has wronged you. And I think it's the same in our relationship because we're built by God, we're created by God, and we're in community with other people who were also created by God. So how can we give ourselves fully to our relationship, to our marriage, to our kids, to our friends, if we're holding on to something back here? that prevents us from being the full person that God has made us to be. How can we do that? So I think unforgiveness stands in the way of our connection, not only with heaven, but our connection with the others around us. So if we want to take steps towards forgiveness, what can we do? What are we supposed to do to forgive? Forgiveness is probably one of the most difficult things we can do as a person. And whether it's forgiving somebody else for something that they have done, I think what's tough is when we, when we are holding on to something, unforgiveness against somebody who hasn't even wronged us, they've wronged our family. Right? We, we, we so easily take on the offenses of others when we, I can't believe you said that to my brother. Nobody's going to talk to my kid that way. I will go to war, you know what I mean? And I'm not a good fighter. I'm soft. But I will go to war, you know, if somebody attacks my kid. (laughs) You didn't see how fast that was, did you? (laughs) Don't even. You know what I mean? I want to read another scripture for you. This is in Hebrews. Now, in Hebrews, this, this author here is walking us through what we have in Jesus, okay? They're going to talk us through what we we get when we we realize and see the sacrifice that Jesus made and when we step into that. Because I I don't know if you know, but a long, long time ago, this was all Jewish culture. And, And Jewish culture said you had to sacrifice, okay, you would come to a temple, And you would bring your sacrifice, and you committed some sin because you're a sinner, obviously. And you would bring, you know, you'd bring your your, your sacrifice up to the altar, and you spill blood. And and that blood, according to Jewish culture, customs, that blood would pay for the sins of you and your family, depending on the animal, depending on the time, you know. And so it was revolutionary 
and scandalous for people to now say, well, because of Jesus, you don't have to do that anymore. Because that was, that's the way that people connected with God for so long. And so it was, it, was, it was uplifting so much history and tradition and culture to say, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Because of what Jesus did, you're good. No more sacrifices are needed. So I want to read you this scripture here. In, 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 in that vein, in that, in that kind of vibe where the, the author is telling this story to the people reading uh, this, this, particular, this particular story, this is Mark 11. Nope, Hebrews. We're going to read Mark 11 again. Uh, this is Hebrews 10, verses 17 and 18. Check this out. This is referring to God, and then God says, okay? And then God says, I will not ever again remember their sins and lawless deeds. So if our sins have been forgiven and forgotten, why would we ever need to offer another sacrifice for sin? If our sins have been forgiven and forgotten, because I think, I think with some of us, at least for me sometimes, I feel like I'll forgive them, but I won't forget. I won't forget what they did. I'll, you know, I'll forgive her for doing that, but I'll never let myself forget how I felt, what she did, and it won't happen again. But I think there's something powerful about combining forgiving and forgetting. I think that's where true love is born and true connection is born when you can not just choose to forgive but forget it because if you never forget and what you have are these scars and then these scars don't remind you of anything good these scars remind you of the wrongs that you've had and I think maybe that's what I've tried to do, and I don't, I don't want to speak for you. And like I said, I've been working through some stuff this week, too. With, I, I think what I've tried to do is forgive and not forget. Okay, I'll forgive. I'll let it slide this time. But I'm not going to forget what you did. And I came face to face with that this week. What would happen if you could forgive and forget? Is that even realistic? How could that be possible? And I, I think what we're scared of, I think this is the fear, this is a fear, maybe not the fear, a fear that we have, is that if I forgive what they did, I am excusing that from happening. If I forgive what they did, if I forgive what they said, if I forgive how they hurt me, if I forgive how they touched me, if I forgive that in my life, then what I am saying is, it's okay, and it's not okay. I'm saying everything's fine, but it's not fine. But if we can shift our perspective from forgiveness being a hall pass to the person that hurt us, I think that's where the freedom is found. That's where you're going to find freedom because here's what happens. God doesn't forgive us because we asked for it. God doesn't forgive us because we deserve it. God forgives us because he chooses connection with us over being right. And I think we are so terrified of letting go of being right that we are keeping that. That is keeping us from being able to forgive others around us and being able to walk in freedom. Because we need to be right. Because you are right. I'm telling you, you are right. You're not wrong. You were hurt. It's not okay. It's not right. But God chooses love over being right. That's why forgiveness is so impossibly difficult, but why it is so amazingly powerful. No one can have power over you because you have the power to forgive them. That's how we're going to be battle ready. And maybe you don't need to forgive anybody right now and everything's, you know, going great in your life. You're feeling strong. Your relationships are good. Well, this is called battle ready, <laughs> because I promise you, in the future, not all of your relationships will be good. I promise you, somebody will betray you. <laughs> and so when somebody betrays you, you don't have to, it doesn't have to shake your world. It doesn't have to shake your faith. It doesn't have to shake the foundations of earth for you. You can say, you know what? I knew something like this was going to happen. Good thing I am armed with peace 
and self-control and forgiveness because this situation, this battle will not be the undoing of my faith. This, uh, this battle I'm facing with my wife or with my husband will not be the undoing of our marriage because I have the power to forgive. I think here's what, here's what we do, or here's what I do. I don't want to keep putting it on you. I'm projecting now. Somebody hurts us, and it's real. Whether it's emotionally, mentally, physically, sexually, somebody hurts us. And we say, they need to be punished. It is not right what they did, and I am going to punish them. I'm going to keep them in my mind. I'm not going to forgive them. And we have, this, we have this area in our life, this prison in our mind called unforgiveness. And they are now a captive. And you will be stuck in this cage, in this cell, until a time that I deem that you can be let out of this cell. But it's more of like, I'm in the cell, and I've given them the key. Because they're out living their life. They're not in my mind. They're out doing their thing. And they're having a great time. But I'm in prison up here. I think I'm holding them captive, and I'm holding myself cap captive and, and giving them the key. They have the key. I've given it to them. I'm the one that's stuck, not them. But if you can choose, if you can choose to forgive, and forgiveness is not an on-off switch, it's not black and white. It's not you forgave them or you didn't forgive them. Man, let forgiveness be a journey for you. Choose to forgive for the next five minutes. Now, I, I often say, and, and I mean it, is that your feelings, your emotions, they are dirty, rotten, selfish liars. They're just loud and they're annoying and they're going to keep at you until you give in to them. That's what your emotions do. Anger keeps coming at you. You're like, fine. It's just easier to be angry. It's easy to be angry instead of trying to fight off anger. Or sadness is coming. You say, you know what? It's easier to just give in to the sadness than it is to keep fighting against this sadness. But I'm telling you that your forgiveness can and will be held hostage by anger and sadness. It seems to me that forgiveness will be so much more difficult if you don't let your emotions run their course. You can let anger come in. You don't give anger the keys to the car. You don't give anger control. But you say, okay, I'm going to be angry about this. And then I'm going to finish being angry. And then I'm going to be sad. And then I'm going to finish being sad. And maybe anger and sadness come back in. But we can't let them take control. We can't let them hold forgiveness hostage we can't let anger and sadness keep us from experiencing the power of forgiveness. We saw in these scriptures that there is this inextricable link between our forgiveness that God has offered and our forgiveness, and our forgiveness that we can offer. God has modeled forgiveness. He has shown us what love can look like. And we can show that to the people around us. We can show that to ourselves. There's power in forgiving those around you. Not because they deserve it. Not because they've asked for it. In fact, when you forgive somebody, you don't set them free. You set you free. That means that, means that when God forgave us, he didn't set us free. He set himself free. He's got to be the freest being around. How freeing would it feel to everyone you know that hurts you? Be like, don't worry about it. We'll get you next time. <laughs> right? Somebody, somebody who hurts your family. How amazing, how amazing would you be, how, how, how many battles would you be ready for if someone hurt you, your family, and you said, that's not going to shake my faith. I forgive you from my heart, and I can do that because God has forgiven me. Can you imagine? What, what would change about your family? What would change about your marriage? What would change about your marriage if you were willing to forgive somebody before they ask for forgiveness? If you were willing to graciously forgive Oh, I love me so